Today is about trying to put people into a space of what we call seeing yourself see. So being an observer of yourself, trying to show people how the brain actually literally makes sense of the world around it. And we're doing that in a number of ways. One is by enabling people to see bumblebees learning to see for the first time. And so they can actually be sort of observers of how these bees make sense, solve a visual puzzle. So the way we do an experiment is first you have to teach them that those are flowers. Okay? So everything's white and everything's rewarding. And then after they, you get a couple of them going up there, sometimes it takes a day, sometimes it takes two days to do that. You put honey on there too, so it gives them a smell. Then, when you, have, when you can tell that they're feeding very regularly, you then pull them off the flowers and put them in the fridge, and they fall asleep. They stop moving, and then you can either super glue a little number on them, or you paint them a color on them. In this case, we've painted a color. Mm -hmm. And so they have to figure out which flower they get a sugar reward. Never pull one of just okay. like, you know, Not all of them have sugar trajectory. reward, only some of them do. And so yeah, they have to find out which ones do. Right? And this particular puzzle was designed by uh, kids from Black Mountain Primary School, two of whom are here, uh, eight to ten year old kids. And the task is that the bees have to find the central flowers. They have to find a blue flowers that are surrounded by yellow, or yellow flowers that are surrounded by blue. And the reason for doing this is that we can study bees to not only understand how bees see, but we can also study bees to understand how we see. Because they can solve problems of vision that our most sophisticated computers can't solve. And they do it with just one million brain cells, which is 250 times fewer cells than we have in one retina. And with, with this we, we did a, a project on how might bees, bees see, and then from there into what games could you play with a bee, what puzzles might you be able to get them to solve, and uh, once they move past the trying to play, you know, they could play football, they could play Monopoly, and then, you know, sort of realizing the limitations of that, and they, they quickly got into thinking about patterns and, and maths, and, and then they got the data, and it, it was amazing, it was, it was original data, and it worked. There was, there was something significant in the, the patterns that emerged, and the children then went into writing up a paper. actually submitting it for publication. So all the kids have written the paper and they are all authors on that paper. Whether any of the editors will touch it is another question because it doesn't have references. I was most looking forward to, to the seeing instruments because some of the other things we've done in different forms but we've never done these instruments before. So people can hear their visual world for the very first time and they can hear it in a very unique way. They can actually make music from a colored image. So in this case, we have three what we call seeing instruments, and those instruments take light, and they translate that light, that light into sound, and they do it through cameras, and so what people can do is they can scan themselves, so their clothes become a musical score, and they can hear the visual image translated into sound. The instruments were designed um, by myself but, and Nick Carey, but mainly by Nick Carey, who, and built by Nick Carey, who is a wonderful furniture designer and woodworker down in Devon. Absolutely brilliant stuff. This is all the sort of the equipment that's needed in order to translate light and sounds, and people can actually see the images that the cameras are seeing, and seeing the images that are being used for this translation. Downstairs, we have three different things going on. One is the Mindshare, which was designed by Beta Tank in Berlin. They're also interested in what's called sensory substitution. In this case, we're translating light into touch. So people sit down in a chair with these spikes sticking out the back, and there's a camera behind them. That camera's looking down onto a shape, and they feel that shape as impressions, vibrations on their back. Uh, and the, the task is if they can recognize that shape. Yeah, it's quite hard. you're pretty good at it. I find it quite difficult actually because the vibrations for me felt like they were all over my back so I couldn't distinguish what shape it was. But you did very well. Yeah, so <laughs> it's good. It's good it's too. Very interesting, so. Next to that is what we call a podium. You have a painting from the Webholm collection. So this is a Bosch painting. There have been symphony orchestra instruments that are aligned with the color coding and hue of the painting. So as you move a finger, several fingers, or both of your hands across the image, it creates song. It's sort of dark now, you're hearing cellos, violin, a little violin. And 
that's it, painting is sound. Finally, we have a new iPhone app where people can download uh, what we call musical images. They can take photographs and then they can touch that photograph, that image, and that where they touch gets translated again into sound. So they can make music by playing a visual image. This is, fits into our work in a number of ways. One at, from the neuroscience, because I run the neuroscience lab at UCL. From that perspective, we're interested in understanding how people make sense. And so to do that, we have to put people into a space that they haven't experienced before. So the translating light into sound is a perfect example. We can try to understand how people learn to navigate their visual world using their ears. We can also use this as a new technology, developing a prosthetic for the visually impaired. Uh, the studio that I run, however, uh, it's used to try to get people to understand that their perceptions and conceptions of the world are shaped by their ecology, by their environment and that interaction with that environment. And understanding that's very, very important um, because that provides, in fact, a basis for understanding creativity, understanding compassion. And so we're taking these neuroscience concepts and putting them into a more public arts kind of environment to try to get people to think about themselves in a little different way. So in other words, they use different layers of strategy. So the first layer is go to blue and yellow in the middle. If there are no blue and yellow in the middle, just go to blue and yellow. If there are no blue and yellow, then go to a different color. So they have layers of possibility. Yeah? Amazing.